This morning I'd like to talk to you about conscious love. As with everything else, there are two forms. There's the inner and the outer, the conscious and the mechanical. So therefore, conscious love and mechanical love. And there are two kinds of love. Basically, when we start to break it down, we can break it down primarily into two kinds of love. Conscious love, mechanical love. What is conscious love? The best thing we can do right now is talk about mechanical love. We really don't know what conscious love is. So what is mechanical love? Well, mechanical love is all the love that we know about. All the love of life. I love chocolate cake. How about you? I love brownies. I love fudge. I love riding in an airplane. I love getting a new ribbon for my uniform. I love getting acknowledged for something that I did. I love my cat. I love my dog. I love my car. I love my house. I love my job. That's mechanical love. It's mechanical. Conscious love is a different kind of love, but it's connected with the idea of a goal, an aim, a gradual perfecting. Mechanical love isn't connected with any kind of goal other than to get what you love and then be dissatisfied with it because it's going to get old, it's going to get outdated, it's going to get broken, it's going to get worn and torn, it's going to get whatever, it, it's going to get stolen. Whatever happens to it, it's going to get that, and then you're going to be attached to it because you were identified with it, and then you're going to get whatever it got. So it gets stolen, you get lost, you get angry, you get resentful, you get bitter, because whoever took what didn't belong to them that was yours, and yada, yada, yada. Conscious love is different than mechanical love in that the idea of a goal was connected with it, an aim. With conscious love, it is something that can grow, something that can be perfected, something that we can move into, something that we can grow into, something that we can head toward. With mechanical love, there isn't anything like that. It's just some outer thing you get something you possess, something that you have or you don't have. As long as you have it, supposedly you're happy. When you don't have it anymore, then you're unhappy. So you find the girl of your dreams or the guy of your dreams and you marry that person and then three years later you get divorced because you found that that really wasn't the girl of your dreams or the guy of your dreams. But let's say you do find the one. Let's say you're one of the 20% of the people on the planet, not even that, in the country, not on the planet, but in the country, who don't get divorced. Nationwide, the divorce rate is 50%. The further west you move, the higher the divorce rate gets. On the east coast, supposedly, it's not as high as it is on the west coast. Now, I guess you get to Hawaii, and it's the highest there. I don't really know that statistic works anymore, but that's what it used to be years ago when I looked into it. The fact is, is that the divorce rate is pretty high in our country. People don't really expect to get married and stay married so much anymore. And if they do, then why are they doing all these prenuptial agreements? Well, just in case something goes wrong. What do you mean just in case something goes wrong? Prenuptial agreements is something new. Maybe it's not new. Maybe there have been times in history where people had prenuptial agreements before. I imagine when people had a lot of money invested, families had a huge, vast sums of money, that prenuptial agreements were something that were... But for the common man, for the everyday man, it wasn't a big deal. It still probably isn't. The common man doesn't have much except debt. Perfect love, that's what conscious love, if its aim is a gradual perfecting, then perfect love is reached through long trial and error. Marriages that last are the ones that grew. Marriages that didn't last are the ones that they were not flexible. They couldn't make the changes that were necessary. The vows used to be for richer and poorer, sickness and in health, till death do us part. Well, those are ridiculous. People don't use those much anymore. People use other vows. They write their own vows now, and they're different. Because those kinds of lasting ideas seem archaic to us now, because love is more mechanical and less conscious. People are not moving toward a growing love, a conscious love, where you actually have to do something through long, endless struggles and trials to get something of value. Now, everything of value is in an outer way. It's looked at in an outer way. It's looked at like a bank account, like or this or like that, or like a better business or a better place to live or a better situation. It's all outer. This conscious business is something that can grow. Love may correspond to the four ways. The four ways. The way of the fakir, the way of the monk, the way of the yogi, the way of the balanced man. Love can be looked at in that way. There's physical love, the way of the fakir. There's emotional love, the way of the monk. Then there's an intellectual love, the way of the yogi. But then there's a balanced love, balanced love that uses all of those, that balances all of those things and grows slowly and expands in every area. And that would be more a conscious love. Our object is to get in touch with higher emotional center directly. That's our object. That's what we're here to do. So that we can, by getting in touch with higher emotional center, directly in touch with higher emotional center, we can then have what we need to propel us to real I, to the real part of us, to the essential, the real part of us that can bring all of us under the control of one I.
so that we can do, so that we can have one will. As it is now, we don't. As it is now, we're scattered, we're fractured, we're fragmented. And the way to get in touch with higher emotional center directly is through love. Ordinary love is turned outward toward physical objects. What is the strongest love that people say there is? A mother for her child. It won't be a parent, it'll be a mother. That's what people will say. People will say, mother love is the strongest love. A mother will do anything for her child. You know, and then they'll go through all of the stories about the things that mothers did for their children. We have mother love, perhaps the strongest mechanical love there is. Conscious love is different. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a mother's love for their child. I'm just saying that conscious love is different. To imagine that we possess perfect love is just foolishness. It's like imagining that you're able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Or imagining that you're able to stop a speeding locomotive. Or imagining that you're indestructible and invincible. It's just not true. It's just foolishness. And if you take that to the street, you will find out what kind of foolishness it really is. We must realize our illusions of love. See, the thing is with us is we love and hate at the same time. And there it is. There's the first illusion. Well, if you love, then why do you hate? I don't hate what I'm loving. No, but if you hate something and you love something else, can you really say that you love? No, you still have to say that you're dual, that you love sometimes and you hate other times. And how many times does love turn to hate? Oh, I love this person. I can't live without this person. They marry that person three years later. Why don't why is it? Why is it three years is the magic number? Three years. That's how long it takes to... First takes us maybe the first year to find out who that other person really is. Then it takes us another year to try and fix them. Then it takes us a year to figure out we're never going to get them fixed and we got to get out of here. So maybe that's why it's three years. I don't know. But it seems to be three years. Some people speed it up. Some people drag it out. Whatever. This isn't about how long it takes to figure out you married the wrong person. This is about conscious love and mechanical love. So we've got to realize our illusions. We love and we hate. We love somebody and then we find out something else about them. They do something and then our reaction is we dislike them and then they do it some more and we, and we tell them they're hurting us and stop doing it and they keep doing it and then we end up hating them. So the love that we had turns to hate or turns to aversion or dislike. We love the degrees of this. Mm -hmm. I didn't really love them that much. Well, I didn't really hate them that much. Look, you either did or you didn't. That's the way it is. But we don't like that. We like a lot of gray area in which we can move so that we can always be right, so that we can always justify our actions, so that we can always justify ourselves, so that we can always keep our illusions. But this isn't about keeping illusions. This is about finding the truth and getting someplace where you can't get with illusions, getting someplace where false personality cannot take you. False personality can take you to a lot of places. They aren't any place you really want to be. You think you want to be there. But then when you get there, there you are. It's like, oh, well, where's the next place? It's like traveling to Europe on one of those tours. If it's Thursday, we must be in Hungary. Friday, so we're probably in Russia now or whatever. And they just go so quickly, they go so fast, they try and jam so much in, you never really get a taste of anything. You never really get to know anything. It's hardly the way to travel. I suppose it's better than nothing, although I'd rather have nothing. Conscious love comes from the love of something higher than your own self or the world. And this is what sets it apart from mechanical love. Mechanical love is all about loving yourself and loving the world or the things in the world. People are things in the world. Cars are things in the world. Houses are things in the world. Animals are things in the world. All these things that we love are all things in the world. That's mechanical love. I'm not saying that that's bad. What I am saying is it's not conscious love. Conscious love comes from something higher. Conscious love can awaken in us something stronger than anything in life. Well, who cares? You'll care if you ever realize that life is running you, that you're not running your life. Life is running you, that you are at the effect, that you're like a machine at the effect of life. This happens, this event happens, that event happens, the stock market crashes, people jump out of windows. The stock market goes up, people go have parties, they celebrate. They make a killing in the stock market. And so they have big parties and they, oh, this is great. And they go and buy themselves great gifts and they go buy other people gifts. They buy themselves better gifts, and they buy themselves, themselves more gifts, but they love somebody, then they buy them a gift too. Just not as nice as the gift they got themselves. And that's mechanical love. The reason that we need to awaken in ourselves something stronger than anything in life is because in order to weather the storms of life, you've got to have something stronger than life inside of you. Conscious love can awaken that. In fact, there isn't any other way to get that awakened. Conscious love can reverse signs in us so that what was active becomes passive. What was passive then becomes active. Well, what good is that? 
they're basically like they're two loves, a mechanical love and a conscious love. They're basically two yous, the outer you and the inner you, the false personality, that part that was acquired by life, that part that life built through your interaction with life, life taught you, the, the associations that you gathered. And then there's the essential you, the part that doesn't get touched by life very much because the false personality has surrounded that essential part of you. And that is what we send out to meet life. So when life knocks at the door of our being, the false personality is the machine that we send to the door to answer the door to find out what life wants. So we never experience life directly. We experience life through the false personality. That's great if you need protecting. And there's a time when your essential self, the essential you does need protecting, and that's why false personality grows. But then there comes a time when the essential you becomes the prisoner of false personality, and you can't get out. And that's not so good. When you realize that that's what's happening to you, when you realize that you're not able to experience life directly, that you are being tossed around by life, that you're being dragged around by life, that you're being booted here and punted there by life, when you realize that and you think there's got to be something better, then you can begin this work. Then you have an opportunity to begin this work. This conscious love that can reverse the signs in us can make false personality passive and can make an essence, the essential part of you, active. It can make the things in life that you now react to passive, and it can make these ideas active so that you respond to life through these ideas rather than react to life through your old associations mechanically without any conscious thought on your part, without anything except knee-jerk reactions. Ordinary love seeks its own. Self-love. But it's our starting point. We start at self-love. Self-love's not so bad. It's a place to start. You love yourself, and you do. You love yourself. You love yourself more than anything, anybody. There'll be people who don't agree with that. Fine. I'm not going to argue with them. They'll either come around to see that they love themselves, or they won't. And if they don't, that means they never really objectively observe themselves. And if they never objectively observe themselves, they can't do this work anyway. There's no point in talking to them or with them, other than to say, you're going to have to observe yourself and see who you really are. And your pride and your vanity have already blinded you so that you can't see who you really are. So you're going to have to separate from your pride and vanity, bite the bullet. Here it is. Are you willing to verify that, yes, indeed, you do love yourself more than anything else, or are you going to hang on to that illusion? If you're going to hang on to that illusion, then you stop here. If you're going to verify that, then there's a possibility of moving forward. So our starting point is self-love. Great. I love myself. Therefore, I'm going to do something for myself. And what I'm going to do for myself is I'm going to wake up. I'm going to try to awaken. I'm going to try and snap out of this stupor that the hypnotism of life has me in, and I'm going to try to come to myself find out what my essential self is, what my real self is, and then live from that instead of from all this outer stuff that the world's told me that I have to do in order to be happy, which of course hasn't really made me happy. So we have two psychologies, outer psychology, the psychology of the world, and an inner psychology, the psychology that the Gospels call the kingdom of heaven. The inner psychology is the psychology of the inner man, the inner life. Imaginary eye and false personality belong to the outer. We're trying to come to another orientation, a new psychology of ourselves. We're trying to see ourselves not as the person in the mirror, but as who we really are inside. But we can't see who we really are inside because there's such a mass of eyes screaming, I'm me, I'm me, no, I'm me, no, I, it's me, I, I, I. So we have all these different fragments of our personality all screaming I at the same time. And whichever one gets into the control room at the moment gets to be I for that moment. And it may be a couple of seconds. It doesn't really matter how long it is. And then another I climbs in, throws that one off the horse on the merry-go-round, and it climbs on the horse and it says, no, I'm I. I'm running the show. I'm running the merry-go-round. Then another I gets up, throws that one off, jumps up on the horse, says, no, I'm I. I'm running the merry-go-round. It's going the way I want it to go. And as you can see, this is a recipe for disaster and unhappiness. We're trying to come to this other orientation. Love of this world is very strong, but this world will pass away. Everything in this world is impermanent. Everything in this world is passing away. Some things more quickly, some things slower. But everything in this world is passing away. So you love something in this world, you have attached yourself to something that is going to pass away. You have put your energies into something that is disintegrating, that is disintegrating. What's going to happen when it disintegrates? We know what happens. We feel loss, we experience grief, we experience all kinds of things that are unpleasant through that identification with something that's not permanent. It's a low percentage thing to do to be attached to what's passing away, but it's something that we do because we don't know any better. When valuation of this work is great, we're strong inside and we're insulated from what happens in life. 
When you've got something to replace the love that we squander on this world, the mechanical love that we throw our energies into for things in this world, when you've got something to replace that, inside you grow stronger. When you become stronger inside, you have something to insulate you from the buffeting, from the changes, from the disintegration of life all around you. When you've got that, you've got something where you can be at peace. You've got something where you can have a will. You've got something where you can have a direction. You've got something that insulates you from the changing landscape of life. There's no need to prove ourselves in life, to satisfy our fear, to keep up false personality, our reputation. We then begin to obey something different. See, in life, we're all trying to prove ourselves. And what we're trying to prove ourselves for is to satisfy our fears. We're run by fears. What is it you're afraid of? I'm not afraid of anything. When you hear that, you know that there's someone who's afraid of almost everything. When you hear someone say, I'm not afraid of anything, make a little mental note. Watch this. This person is afraid of almost everything. Almost everything has got this person afraid. This person is a control freak. People who are not afraid of anything think they're in control or they want to control, or they can control. They don't understand that life cannot be controlled, people cannot be controlled. Eventually, it gets out of hand. Eventually, you lose your grip. Eventually, it gets away from you. And when it does, it does what it wants to do or what it does. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm not afraid of anything until I get cancer. I'm not afraid of anything until my kid gets cancer. I'm not afraid of anything until the earthquake. I'm not afraid of anything until... I'm not afraid of anything either when there's nothing going on. It's only when something happens that I start to get fearful. Well, what's going to happen to me? Well, what's going to become of me? Where am I going to go wake up? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? How am I going to live? What am I going to eat? What's going to happen to me? What will become of me? But we're not afraid of anything. But those things are all questions that we are constantly weighing and determining and planning to avoid. Well, if this happens, then... So I was talking to Joshua this morning. Well, Josh, why are you working for the money? Okay, Josh, what are you doing that? I'm saving the money. What are you saving it for, Josh? Whatever I need, a uh, down payment on a house or a, a car or an apartment, to get an apartment or a rainy day. I'm saving it for a rainy day. What is that if it's not fear? I'm saving it for a time when I won't have the ability to work. Because why? Because nobody will take care of me. I have to take care of me. And it's fear-based. It's not that relax into the hands of the universe and say, look, I was put here. I was born here. Everything that I need in order to survive and grow and realize my goal here my mission here, my aim here, is all provided for me by the same universe that provided this body for me. You ever going to buy a body? No. <laughs> it was provided for you, free of cost. Can you buy parents? No. They're provided for you, free of cost. The universe provided bad parents for me. Really? Based on what? Based on your likes and dislikes? Or based on your mission in life? Based on your mission in life, the parents that were supplied to you were the perfect parents. The school that was supplied to you was the perfect school. The siblings that were supplied for you were the perfect siblings. But you had some other aim, some other goal, some other reason for being here. To feel good, to satisfy yourself, to chase a pony up there on the merry-go-round. But actually the truth is, and you will, we will all come to realize this as we wake up, is that everything that was provided for us was provided for us for our growth, so that we could grow. Not in an outer way, but in an inner way. And that's the problem. Until we realize that we're here to grow in an inner way, none of this is going to make much sense. None of this is going to be very satisfying. So that's why we need to develop conscious love so that we can have that strong inside place that can insulate us from what happens in life so that we don't have to prove ourselves in life so that we can satisfy our fear so that we don't have to keep up false personality so that we don't have to keep people thinking, well, he's this or he's that or she's this or she's that. They're very special and this is good and that's good and well, that's bad. We don't have to worry about our reputation, what people think of us anymore. That would be a lot of freedom right there. We begin to obey something different. Passing through the doorway called self-observation, we find what we really want and can really get. Everybody wants what they can't get and they settle for what they don't want. That's how life works in an outer way. Well, I really wanted to marry Donald Trump, but he was already married, and so that didn't work out. Well, I really wanted to marry Bill Gates, but he didn't like me, so I couldn't meet him, or oh, I didn't live in Washington, or we didn't go to school together, or whatever, you know. I really wanted that, but I didn't get that, so I settled for this. What a great way to live life. And we wonder why we're unhappy. That's why people are unhappy. 
What we're talking about is through self-observation, we can begin to find what we really want and what we can really get. Because what you really want, you can really get. But I'm not talking about what the false personality wants. I'm talking about what the essential you really wants. And through self-observation, you can find out what you really want. Because what you really want is what your essential self came here to get. And once you find out what that is simply by observing it, by seeing what it is, then you'll know that you can really get it. As we cease inventing ourselves, we cease inventing other people. See, we invent ourselves every day. You're talking to somebody, you're inventing yourself the whole time. They say this, you invent something to harmonize with that. They like this, then you become that. They don't like that, then you're not that. Politicians are the perfect example of that. Talk to a politician. It's like a Wesson oil party with a room full of snakes. How do you deal with that? They change every minute. It's like catching clouds. They constantly reinvent themselves. They're talking to a group of people, and these people think this way. Okay, well, then that politician says, well, then I'll give you all that. And then they talk to another group of people and it's the exact opposite. Well, that's no, nope. I'll give you all that. Well, how are you going to do both of those? Just keep them apart. Just don't let those two groups get together and know that you're telling one group this and the other group that. We're constantly inventing ourselves. And because we're constantly inventing ourselves, we're constantly inventing other people. Instead of meeting and knowing them from outside, and that's how we meet and know people. We meet and know people from outside. Oh, hello, Diana. My name's James, and I know Diana now because she has these black room glasses and her hair's like that, and she wears these clothes, and she lives here. It's all outside. We know all about the outside, but we don't meet people inside. So instead of meeting and knowing people from the outside, what happens is we begin to feel and know them from the inside outwards. And there's some people who have a knack for this, some people who can just meet somebody and they have a feeling about the person, no matter what it looks like, no matter what the person looks like on the outside. You remember last week we talked about John Wayne Gacy, how he looked so good from the outside. He was big in the community, did all these things, benefits for children and things like that. But on the inside, he was this totally different person. Well, there were some people who... Maybe there were some people. I don't even know if there were some people. But, but it is possible that there was someone who had a sense about the guy and said, you know, there's just something not right about this guy. And they got out of his life. And it may have saved their life. And then there were other people who just depended on the outside and they went down the path with him and ended up buried under his house. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about beginning to feel and know from the inside outwards. We feel a common existence without passion when we begin to move into conscious love. A common existence without passion. What does that mean? It means I feel my kinship with all life, but it's without passion. It is just an acknowledgement of a universal fact of life. There's no question about it. There's no need to get you to understand it. It just is the way it is. And that's the direction that we need to grow in. That's the direction that love can be perfected in, in that direction, not in the outer direction. It's simply what it is. No further definition is needed. I have a kinship with all life. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but I don't need to define it. You can define it for yourself if you can recognize that you have it. If you don't recognize you have it, does that mean you don't have it? Well, let's say you're a baby and you're just born. A baby is born, and if it's born a normal baby, it's got a head, it's got two ears, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, it's got hair or no hair, but it's got some hair somewhere. And it's got two hands, five fingers on each hand. And then it's got two legs and two arms and feet and toes. And, you know, we look at them and we go, okay, is it normal? Yeah, it's a normal baby. It's got all the right stuff. Does the baby know that? <coughs> no. The baby then discovers its hand. It discovers its fingers. It discovers its nose. It discovers all of these parts. It doesn't know that. Can it have it without knowing it has those things? Yes. Can you have things without knowing you have those things? Yes. Can you have a common existence with all life? Yes, you can. Can you have that and not know it? Yes. Here, we dimly understand conscious love. At this point, we begin to dimly understand what conscious love is about. It just starts to dawn on us. Everything that shares life shares it with me. What does that mean? Well, that's what you have to understand. Well, that's the direction in which you have to grow. We must separate ourselves from inventions, pictures, falsities, before reaching this indefinable point of conscious love. What pictures? Pictures that we have of ourselves. What pictures do I have of myself? Well, I have the picture of myself that I'm a loving person and a good person. Well, I have the picture of myself that I'm honest, that I never lie. Well, I have the picture of myself that I'm very generous. Well, great. With those pictures, you'll never be able to see anything that conflicts with those pictures, especially if we are identified with those pictures. It's only when we can step back from those pictures and see that they are simply pictures, and they may or may not represent some aspect of our life. 
Some of our favorite memories, some of our favorite pictures were never taken with a camera. They were taken with the camera of imagination. And we retouch those photos all the time. In fact, we are constantly reinventing ourselves, retouching the photos, fixing them up here so that we don't look bad there, we don't look bad there. And so we just blot things out. Oh, I don't like those wrinkles. Shh, they're gone. Oh, the gray hair, Shh, that's gone. We still leave hair, but it's not gray anymore. We just color it. People do this on the outside, too. Plastic surgery, Clairol, blah, 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 Botox, on and on and on and on and on. But the bottom line is we're doing it inside, too, and it's more deadly there. Out here, it's obvious. Look at how obvious toupees and wigs are. We look at that and we go, oh, jeez, does he know? Look at how obvious comb-overs are. We look at that guy. The guy knew what he looked like. He'd shave his head. He'd look better if he just didn't do that. Or you see somebody who's like 85 years old and their hair is all dyed. And they get this really ashen, white, pale face and their hair is all dark. And you look and you go, why do you dye your hair? You're 85 years old. Did you think you were going to fool us? Do you understand what I'm saying? They're not really fooling themselves, but they're reinventing themselves. So we've got to separate ourselves from inventions, separate ourselves from the pictures that we have, separate ourselves from the falsities before reaching this indefinable point. We're led to this by something stronger than life. We're led to this point of conscious love by something stronger than life because it doesn't come from life. It comes from the essential you. It comes from what created the essential you. Well, what is that? Well, this is why we don't talk about God because people have a thousand different ideas of what God is. So it's pointless to even talk about it. We'll just say that it's whatever it is that is the origin of your real self. From that origin comes everything that your real self needs to grow, to get back to the origin, to feed itself, to be fed, to nourish it, to teach it, to educate it, because your true self came here to grow. That's what your true self came here for, to grow, to get things here that it couldn't get anywhere else. Like what? Like conscious love, for one thing. Like being able to develop and perfect love. Real, genuine, conscious love, as opposed to mechanical love. Many others have reached this point in the past. From them we draw strength and inspiration. Well, who? Gandhi, Buddha, Jesus, Mother Teresa. There are a lot of people who tapped into conscious love, who found a universal something that transcended all the love of the world, that transcended it, simply transcended it. From those people we get inspiration. They're not like us. That's right, they're not like us. But that doesn't mean that we can't become like them. I've heard people say, oh, well, nobody can be like this. Nobody can be like that. No, nobody that we know can be, but you can be if you become a new man, if you become a new person, if you become a new creation. The seed of that is already in you. It's who you were born to be. But this hull, this husk around that seed, the false personality is what keeps you from becoming what it is that you were meant to be. Wake up. If we're to reach it, we must grow through endless struggles, endless failures, confusions, uncertainties, and all of this has to be done through inner choice. See, as it is right now, you have endless struggles, endless failures, endless uncertainties, but you have that mechanically. There's nothing you can do about that. But I'm talking about taking a different direction, a different path, an inner path. Instead of an outer path, turn and take the inner path where you consciously accept through inner choice the struggles, the uncertainties, the failures. And you accept them all as part of the learning process, part of the growing process, through inner choice. Love which has been perfected casts out all fear. You remember what we said about problems? They all basically come from fear. We're afraid of this, we're afraid of that, all the things that we're afraid of. Love which has been perfected casts out all fear. Only real I can love consciously. What a large number of eyes we must leave behind by our own choice to reach real I. Jennifer and I were talking this morning, and she said, you know, I had a moment of awareness where it was like I came up and I touched this thing that was light, and I knew I had the answer. I knew what it was, and so I, real quick, I thought, oh, i got to tell him this, and I text message you this thing. She said, and then I forgot all about it. I forgot what it was. It was like I just sunk back down into the darkness. And I said, yeah, it's like fish, a fish that comes up to the surface, you know, up out of the darkness, up to the surface, it sees something up on the surface, it comes up, and it snaps at that something on the surface. And then it gets it and it goes back down. Yeah. And what this is about is getting out of that and into the boat so that you don't have to go back down anymore. And conscious love is about that. It's about giving up all of this madness down here. Why did it go back down there? Well, because that's where his home was. That's where his family was. That's where his school, other school of fish were. Why does it go back down there? Because that's where it keeps all of its goodies. That's where everything that it likes is. Well, why did it go up there? Well, because it had this tasty tidbit up there and it went up there to get that. But then it went back down to where it lives. And so this is why we live in the lower parts of ourselves. 
because that's where we keep all of this mechanical stuff, in the tiny little mechanical lower parts of ourselves. But what this work is calling us to do is to come up out of that and get out of that altogether and get into the boat, get into another room, get into another experience, get out of the pond into another experience, a boat that can carry us across the pond to land that can take us to another experience. And that's what this is about. And what a large number of eyes we have to leave behind by our own choice in order to reach real eye. And where is real eye? On the land somewhere, and we're under the water somewhere. So we've got to get up, we've got to get in the boat, we've got to get the boat to the land. Then we've got to traverse across the land to get to the place where real eye is. Well, it's a long journey, it's true, but it's a journey worth making. But you've got to leave a lot of eyes behind. And we realize, I don't want to leave them behind. You don't have enough valuation for real eye. Try to make a stronger feeling of the work in yourself then. Try to understand what it's for, what it's calling you to do, what it offers you. Try to understand what this means. This is a totally different paradigm. This is something outside of anything that we can comprehend at the moment. You have to believe there's something higher. This work leads to that something higher because it comes from something higher. And it's calling you back to something higher. It's connected to the conscious circle of humanity throughout all of the ages. The conscious circle of humanity hasn't changed. It's added to throughout the ages, but it doesn't change. The people who are conscious are still conscious. They form this huge conscious circle of humanity. And those people, those people who have walked the path, those people who have gotten out of the pond, into the boat, to the land, across the land, who've made it through all the struggles, who've made it through all the failures, who've made it through all the uncertainties, who've struggled against it all, who found the way, who've learned the path. Those people are there to give aid to those who wish to travel that same path and get there. They're not setting up roadblocks. They're not hiding anything. They're holding the answer right in front of us, but we're too busy with our little tiny mechanical stuff. So here it is. Develop conscious love. Well, why? Is it going to get me a better house? Why? Is it going to get me a better job? Maybe. Maybe not. That doesn't have anything to do with it. I don't know the answer to that. Could happen. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe do just the opposite. I don't know. That's not the point. The point is, can you value something bigger than your little world now? Because if you can't, you can't get out of your little world now. We mustn't be creatures of the moment. We must have a greater aim. We must have a greater vision. And we must work toward that. Not live for this moment, but live in this moment, consciously, with an aim. And let that aim be the highest aim that we can understand at the moment. And then when that understanding becomes greater, then let that new aim become greater as our understanding increases. And that's what I'm talking about.